Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the fifth session of the Caribbean Climate and Health Responders course that's hosted by Columbia University, the Mailman School of Public Health, via the Global Consortium on Climate, Health, and Education. Earth Medic Earth News, PAHO, UE West Indies, University of the West Indies, and CIMH of the Caribbean. Uh, this fifth session is uh, all about talking about air quality. And what we're going to do is delve into some really interesting topics on climate change and air quality, because as you may know, air quality and air pollutants is actually the root cause of climate change. But besides the effects on climate change, it also has some immediate health impacts for people who are exposed to those very same air pollutants. So this session promises to be very interesting. Just a reminder, this session, because of the number of Spanish speaking participants in the session, we have a facility to allow um, interpretation. We have Spanish at the bottom. So if you would like to be able to uh, hear and um, receive the interpreted, the Spanish version of the sessions that are being presented, look for that button on your screen that will allow you to benefit from the service. There is live interpretation in English and Spanish. So I hope you enjoy. Uh, if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat. There is a Q&A segment uh, button at the bottom that will allow you to put your sessions. Now, this is the, the course is, has been well underway. It started earlier this month, and many of you have been with us since the beginning. This fifth session is degraded air quality. And air quality, as it has, I'll, I'll repeat again for um, anyone who may have missed it, air quality and the contaminants in air is actually what is responsible for absorbing heat in the atmosphere and causing um, global shifts in that heat balance, which um, the end result is changes in the weather and climate patterns and the global, the climate zones um, of our planet as it is. So there is that shift caused by that change heat, heat balance. And today we're gonna to talk about, delve into this topic. The objectives of today's seminar promise to be fascinating and eye-opening. Even for me, I'm a air pollution scientist and um, I had a sneak peek at the presentations and the information is riveting. So hold on to your seats. The, the learning objectives for this, this session include describing the pathways through which um, climate change affects um, the pathways that uh, certain pollutants affect climate change as well as some of the impacts of these pollutants um, on health, such as um, impacts on asthma, on COPD, chronic lung disease, cardiovascular disease, allergic rhinitis. Uh, we're gonna talk some more about um, people who may be affected by air quality and degraded air quality. We will talk about um, what this means for health professionals, because, um, the thing is, even though many environmentalists and meteorologists can attest to noticing these trends and being able to see what has been happening with the um, the, the shifts in, in climate, the shifts in weather, the shifts in um, the global heat exchange, the people that have to deal with the fallout of these changing environments and the impacts on health are the healthcare professionals. So this is where the healthcare professionals and the air pollution scientists and the meteorologists and the natural scientists have to have um, this meeting of minds to understand this problem and the gravity of this problem. We will describe um, near-term health and co-benefits. Cool example, what we can be what can be done to improve air quality, and in the short term, what can be done to address some of the issues that would be presented um, by the patients, uh, how we would deal with those circumstances and how we interpret um, the what's presented to by the patient to the health professional and what they will 
how they were able to diagnose what the possible problems are. So just some housekeeping. The session is 90 minutes long. It includes uh, three expert lectures and presentations, at the end of which you will be invited to um, have your questions answered. During the course of the seminar, while you are uh, listening and you get, um, so you're, you're, you're moved to have a question, please put your questions in the Q&A button, the Q&A window on your, um, on your screen. The questions will be collated and as much as possible, the questions will be answered at the end of the session. And if not, they will be collated and later answered by the presenters and the expert panelists. All sessions will be recorded and posted on the website within 24 hours as well the sessions as well as the references that uh, may be of interest to you on this topic. Certificate of participation will be granted to um, anyone who's so interested. Participants who attend 70% of the live Zoom sessions and pass the final exam with a score of 70% at the end of the course will be awarded a certificate of participation in the climate and health from Earthmatic Earth News and GCCHE. You're required to join each class using your personal Zoom link, as well as complete the final exam using this Zoom link and the email address that would be initially used to register for the course. Your attendance is automatically logged, so you don't have to worry about whether um, that's gonna happen. The exam link will be sent on the final day of class via email and will remain open for 24 hours and certificates will be awarded on May 9th, 2024. One CCME credit is applied per session attended in person. The application is made by completing the Google link that will be posted in the chat before the end of every session. The link is live for two hours after the session, so you can pay attention during the sessions. And as soon as the course is finished, you can take your time and fill out the required survey. Free credits are recognized by organizations within CARICOM to allow you to, um, that may be put into the courses that you, courses that you may be interested in pursuing. These are expert panelists today who would be presenting on various topics. Our distinguished panelists will start up, um, our distinguished speakers will start off with Dr. Andrea Seely. She is a meteorologist at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology. She's a lecturer in meteorology at the University of West Indies, where she also supervises postgraduate research students, MPhil and PhDs. She chairs the Pan American Regional Steering Group for the World Meteorological Organization Sand and Dust Storm Warning Advisory and Assessment System. And she's also a member of the global um, of the global group for which uh, she chairs. She is a member of several other professional organizations, include several other WMO professional organizations, including the Warning and Advisory Assessment. Sand and Dust Storm Warning and Assessment Global Steering Committee, the WMO Global Atmospheric Watch Capacity Development Task Team, the Caribbean Aerosol Health Network, the American Meteorological Society, and the American Geophysical Union. At the CIMH, she coordinates all the outreach activities and as well as, well as uh, is responsible for coordinating um, the activities of the dust and air quality forecasting center. So she's quite the professional in being able to talk about what the Caribbean is with respect to, what is the state of the Caribbean with respect to dust and how it affects um, Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean. Andrea is well qualified. She has a BSc in meteorology, manga cum laude from Jackson State University, a master's MSc in meteorology from Pennsylvania State and a PhD in atmospheric sciences from Howard University. She has worked at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, as an advanced study program, as a, 
Advanced Study Program Doctoral Fellow, and she currently lectures at UWE. So we're lucky to have her. Our second presenter is um, presenting in absentia. He is a consultant respiratory physician at the Medical Associates Private Hospital here in Trinidad, as well as a consultant at our state hospitals, the Core Hospital and the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex Hospital. He's a former lecturer, lecturer at UE MedSci. He is the president of the Thoracic Society of Trinidad and Tobago, and he's an advocate and assembly member of the Global Initiative of Asthma and Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. He is a member of the National Burden of Obstructive Lung Disease Study in Trinidad and Tobago. He is a fellow and member of various international respiratory professional organizations, an editorial member of several medical um, journals and respiratory journals. He is the author of over 40 articles published in various peer-reviewed peer journals. His most notable pertinent to this presentation is a publication that entitled Increasing Transatlantic Intrusion of Sahara Dust, Is It a Cause for Concern? And the Impact of Air Pollution on the Incidence and Mortality of COVID-19. Now, this is quite interesting and quite pertinent to recent events. Our final presenter is none other than our dear Dr. Paula Henry. She is a family physician who graduated from UE Mona in 1980. She obtained her MPH from UE St. Augustine recently. Dr. Henry has an MBA from Edinburgh University, uh, the Edinburgh School of Business, and a diploma in political science from the University of London School of Economics. So I'd like to hand you over to Dr. the presenters. I'd like to first hand over to Dr. Seeley. Dr. Seeley, welcome. And um, please take over the show. Okay. Thank you, Hima. And it is a pleasure to be here. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, well, evening for me. And um, I am really pleased and honored to have been invited to present again uh, for this second edition of the Car Caribbean Climate and Health Responder course. And I really enjoyed the first time I presented and had a really enjoyable interaction with the panelists, the attendees, and I look for, sorry, with the attendees, and I look forward to doing so once again. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with the presentation. And I think you all should be able to see it now. So yeah. Um, yeah. this, yeah, great. So this is gonna be on degraded air quality and I'm going to talk about or try to uh, refer to specific uh, examples in terms of the Caribbean. Um, but a lot of it, even if it is general, it does apply to our region. So I will go ahead and advance, yes. So you would be familiar with the learning objectives. So I'm not going to go into those again. These are some that are broken down in a little bit more detail in terms of what I am going to present on um, in this lecture. So basically, um, according to the World Health Organization, in 2019, 99% of the world population was living in places where the WHO air quality guideline levels were not met. So nine out of 10 people in the world are breathing polluted air. And that was at 2019. So we talk about air quality in terms of the ambient, which is the outdoor air pollution or air quality and indoor, in particular household, but also at the workplace to that because a lot of people spend considerable time either in a household, the workplace, or both. And this, both the ambient and the indoor air quality or indoor air pollution, I should say, combined together cause approximately 7 million premature deaths every year. And as a result, you have increased mortality from stroke, IHD, COPD, lung cancer, and acute respiratory infections. 
In fact, according to the WHO, air pollution kills 13 people every minute. So the key air pollutants that are uh, set out in the air quality guidelines would be ozone, particulate matter, PM 2.5 and PM 10 specifically, nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. And I'm going to talk about those a little bit more as well. And these WHOAQGs, as they're called, set goals to reduce air pollution. You have the interim targets, which they help countries to continuously improve air quality. Then you have the recommended AQG levels to protect persons from air pollution. And on the next slide, we have these recommended AQG levels, and these were updated in 2021. They were initially set in 2005, but updated a few years ago. And they are evidence health-based standards for specific air pollutants that should be adopted. The interesting thing to know is that given the research and the studies that have been updated since these AQG levels were set in 2005, leads us to the point where most of these new recommended limits for concentrations and exposures are lower. So this 2021 update shows us that air pollution affects many aspects of health and even at lower levels than originally thought. So we have, and we're going into the bit of the atmospheric science and meteorology here to get give you a feel for what these pollutants are. So we have ozone, O3. It is primarily in the layer of the atmosphere where we live, which is the troposphere, well, and the stratosphere. Most of it, though, in terms of the amounts, 90% is in the stratosphere, which is the good ozone, the ozone layer which we hear so much about. And the stratosphere, is at a, it's at about 25 to 30 kilometers in altitude. The tropospheric ozone, which is in a layer here where we live, where we experience our weather, is the pollutant that we're talking about. So the bad ozone. And this is mostly created as a byproduct of anthropogenic activities, uh, creating photochemical smog. So it's a secondary pollutant. Sunlight is required for production of, of um, ozone, tropospheric ozone, or ozone in general. And the concentrations of tropospheric ozone are higher during afternoons and summer months as a consequence of how it is produced. So various pollutants are involved in the production of photochemical smog, which consists of both primary and secondary pollutants. And some of the pollutants that are monitored or listed in the air quality guidelines are also a part of this whole cocktail um, we have of these primary and secondary pollutants. So NOx, SOx, uh, PM, and I'll talk about those shortly. So particulate matter, PM 2.5 and PM 10 uh, specifically. It is a mixture of solid particles and liquid droplets found in the air, suspended in air. PM 10 would be the inhalable particles with diameters 10 micrometers and smaller. PM 2.5 fine inhalable particles with diameters 2.5 micrometers and smaller. And some of the sources of particulate matter include construction sites, unpaved roads, fields, smoke stacks, fires, uh, to name, you know, including other things. And the harmful effects would be that you have these microscopic solids or liquid droplets that are easily inhaled. So the PM10 particles can get deep into the lungs or even the bloodstream, but the finer particles, the PM2.5, pose the greatest risk to health. Also, in terms of PM, you can have reduced visibility, which also affects health and safety as well. In terms of other pollutants, nitrogen dioxide, NO2, that's part of the highly reactive NOx gases family, oxides of nitrogen or nitrogen oxides, and is used as the indicator for the larger group of NOx. Most NOx start as nitrous oxide. We have VOCs in the atmosphere that convert to nitrogen dioxide, this reacts with others to form nitric acid, nitric acid and peroxyacyl nitrates. Um, sunlight is also, also needs to be present in terms of nitrogen dioxide converting back to NO and producing another pollutant we mentioned before, our ozone, our tropospheric ozone. Sulfur dioxide, SO2, is used as the indicator for the larger group of gaseous sulfur oxide, SOX. 
The largest atmospheric source is the burning of fossil fuels by power plants and other industrial facilities. And then we have smaller sources, industrial processes, natural sources such as volcanoes, um, lo locomotives, uh, ships, and other vehicles, and also heavy equipment that burn fuel that contains a high amount of sulfur. Carbon monoxide, CO. Outdoor sources would be vehicles or machinery that burn fossil fuels. But then the indoor sources, things like unvented kerosene and gas space heaters, leaking chimneys and furnaces, and gas stoves. So very significant, not only in terms of the ambient air, air pollution, but also indoor air pollution and indoor air quality. So now we go on to talk about air quality in the Caribbean, and we're going to talk about both a bit of both about the uh, ambient, the outdoor air quality, and indoor air quality. So there have been studies that looked at the exposure to particulate matter one in particular in 2005, uh, noted that exposure to particulate matter in 26 cities across the Caribbean and Latin America is more than twice the U.S. standard. The only uncertainty in terms of what this study found was the ground level um, ozone that I mentioned. That's the secondary pollutant for the chemical smog. And this was due to lack of data. Air pollution is a major contributor to morbidity and mortality, especially in developing countries. And that includes our own regional territories. And this is partly due to things like uh, lack of air quality regulations, and not only lack of air quality regulations, even if you have the air quality regulations, lack of enforcement, and then also socioeconomic, geographic, and climatological factors. So sources in terms of what affects air quality include things like burning fossil and biomass fuels to generate electricity for uh, activities such as heating, cooking, and transportation. So you have PM 2.5 and PM 10, CO, and other pollutants in there that you would have heard mentioned, and that show up in terms of the air quality guidelines, what's monitored in the air quality guidelines. Windblown dust, um, including Saharan dust, but also dust from uh, in, uh, industry and um, fugitive dust and so on. We have wildfires. We have gases and particulate matter emitted from volcanic eruptions. And the origins are not only local and regional sources, but also distant global sources. So for example, transportation of volcanic ash and dust across long distances. And you know, Saharan dust is one of my, my pet things. Uh, Saharan dust, for example, across long distances, it has been shown to contribute to air pollution and respiratory diseases in some Caribbean countries. And at the end of my presentation, I have a list of references that include some of the studies that will talk about this or mention this or study this. In terms of indoor air quality, almost 50% of deaths due to pneumonia among children under five years of age are caused by particulate matter like soot inhaled from household air pollution. So why does indoor air make us sick? We have odors, we have volatile chemicals from furniture and construction materials. Fine particles and chemicals from humans, uh, anthropogenic processes. We have very small pollution particles that come in from the outdoors as well, because we're not gonna be insulated or we, we open our windows and so on in, in, in our region. We, we don't necessarily keep our windows closed. It might happen in other, in other climates, but in the tropical climate, you open your windows. And we also have mold toxins. And some of the effects of indoor air pollution would include the respiratory, uh, aggravating respiratory conditions, lung infection, uh, heart ailments, asthma, and, and irritation of the nose and throat, confusion, headache, anxiety. And another interesting thing to know in terms of air quality and a very significant thing we need to look at is climate change and wildfires. So what is so important about wildfires? I mean, besides the obvious, we're talking about air quality, what comes from, from wildfires in terms of small PM? We'll talk about that in a minute. But wildfires significantly affect the global carbon cycle. 
So this has a lot to do with climate change because we know a climate change indicator is the amount of carbon that is emitted globally. And the wildfires significantly affect this cycle because of the occurrence, their occurrence in ecosystems that store large amounts of terrestrial carbon. What happens then, because we have these wildfires, we end up with the CO2, large quantities of carbon dioxide being released. And this would actually, uh, more than likely, would accelerate the positive feedback loop in the carbon cycle. So you have more carbon dioxide being released, and this would contribute to rising temperatures, because carbon dioxide is one of our principal greenhouse gases. And if you look at this uh, figure on the slide, it actually shows various um, climate scenarios from the IPCC report. We see near term, medium term, and long term in terms of the global change in welfare events for the most uh, aggressive versus the most um, conservative scenario. So the most conservative scenario would be if we limited our emissions as much as possible to keep the global temperature change, average temperature change below a certain level, below two degrees Celsius, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and then our CP 6.0, which would be if emissions were more, if we had more emissions, we didn't constrain them. And even with the... Um, more conservative scenario where we try really hard to keep the emissions as low as possible or the lowest emission scenario, we still are likely to see a significant increase in welfare events, at least initially. So that is something to think about, that we we will see increase an increase in welfare. It's just a matter of how much or can it eventually be mitigated based on sticking to or adhering to what would make us um, realize the lowest emission scenario. So the RCPs, that stands for Representative Concentration Pathway. And as I mentioned, the RCPs have to do with the scenarios. So in, in the 2.6 case, that would be the one that is most likely to keep global warming below 2 degrees Celsius by 2100. It would eventually have a significant impact on reducing welfare occurrence, but it's the yellow one at the bottom. You still will get an increase to a point. It will not, it will be constrained eventually, but the point is, is that we are on a path to having our um, wildfire still increase at some point. So we have this diagram, this schematic from Cicero 2021, and it shows the potential reinforcing feedback loop of climate change on wildfires. And what we are seeing is that climate change is expected to directly affect the frequency and magnitude of the extreme weather that would be facilitating the outbreak and spread of wildfires. It will also lead to longer wildfire seasons where the fire season may begin earlier and end later, for example. And we know that increased wildfire activity can positively impact greenhouse gas emissions that reinforce climate change drivers. And UNET actually put, uh, published this in a report in 2022. And why is all of this so important? The sustained exposure to smoke particulate matter can be fatal, especially with persons with impaired lung function or other pre-existing health problems. So how is climate change expected to impact air quality? We know the long-term cumulative effects of greenhouse gases uh, is a major factor in terms of global warming. The emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions are an important indicator of climate change because they impact global warming. Climate change is expected to alter the concentration of airborne respiratory allergens because of carbon dioxide and temperature impact on plant growth. And this impacts the health burden of weather and climate events such as wind blown dust and mold, for example. So to put some things in perspective in terms of climate change and air quality, I took a couple snippets from the last IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's six assessment report from working group one, the physical science uh, basis. 
And I took the regional fact sheet for small islands and took some snippets from that that are related to what we were talking about here in terms of climate change and air quality. So the observed warming, high confidence in the small islands has been attributed to human influence, medium confidence. Warming will continue in the 21st century for all global warming levels and future emission scenarios, which would further increase heat extremes and heat stress, high confidence. Heat extremes, are a big part of the kind of weather conditions that would facilitate wildfires. Uh, small islands will face more intense, but generally fewer tropical cyclones, except in the central North Pacific, where frequency will increase, medium confidence, at a global warming level of two degrees Celsius and above. So even if you're in a region that will get fewer tropical cyclones, cyclones you would expect to get or are expected to get more intense tropical cyclones, which still would bring more um, rainfall or more intense. Uh, uh, so you have more intense flooding. Flooding uh, would it be would bring an, would would bring about an environment that is conducive to mold. So that is an example. And then in the Caribbean specifically, the declining trend in rainfall during June, July, August will continue in coming decades at a high confidence for two degrees Celsius global warming and above. Higher evapotranspiration under warming climate will result in increased aridity and more severe agricultural and ecological droughts in the Caribbean with medium confidence. So this has a couple of things I'll mention too. This impacts the weather or the, con and the atmospheric conditions conducive to wildfires. But it also uh, facilitates the atmospheric conditions conducive to more um, dust and more particulate matter being emitted from far from dust, for example, but more dust, more dusty conditions, increase aridity. So something to think about in terms of the air, the the predictions or the expectations in terms of the IPCC report climate and what could impact air quality from that report, what we can, what conditions would, would impact air quality. So air, the, the, so climate change is predicted to impact air quality by altering the concentration and distribution of major air pollutants, uh, CO2, O3, fine PM and aeroallergens. So they're expected increases in environmental exposure to particulate matter. Uh, Saharan dust, black carbon, pollens, mold, other bioaerosols, and the ground level ozone we talk about. Extreme weather changes would create environments conducive for mold, mildew, and other bioaerosols. And also, we expect a major impact on terrestrial ecosystems of small islands. So increasing the atmospheric carbon via reduction in the natural carbon sinks. So increased atmospheric CO2 levels, as one example, is associated with an increase in ragweed, which flourishes in tropical and subtropical climates. And also, too, poor, uh, ag this would also be aggravated, the, the impact on terrestrial ecosystems would also be aggravated by poor land use management, indiscriminate uh, burning practices, urbanization and industrialization, rapid population growth, and the other things that come along with that. So how can we prepare and protect? And this is from the atmospheric scientist, meteorologist perspective, and with some examples in terms of what we do at CMH. So we have observations, we have predictions. We can issue information like advisories or bulletins, both short-term and seasonal. And I have two links here that would be useful for everyone. The um, CIMH host the, is the WMO Caribbean Regional Climate Center. The website is there. And we also have a dust and air quality forecasting center. And there are other mitigation strategies as well. So there are ways to, we talked about, I talked about, or I just mentioned observations. So in terms of observations, monitoring, we have satellite imagery, we have other observations, instrumentation that, that would indicate uh, how bad the air quality is. So for example, on the east coast of Barbados at Ragged Point, we have a site that is managed by the University of Miami since 1965. 
Ragged Point therefore has the longest running global, has the long, longest running dust observation globally. Yes, in the entire world, Ragged Point in Barbados. And so there is an in, there's instrumentation out there that measures dust on sap on uh, filters from sap the sapling. There's also an instrument that gives something called aerosol optical depth, which gives you an indication of how dusty the atmosphere might be. In that case, on in Ragged Point, you find generally the aerosol optical depth increases when you have a significant dust event. So these are some of the tools we have in terms of monitoring. I also mentioned predictive, predict, predictive capability, predictions. And this example you see here on this slide is a model forecast from the weather research and forecasting model that we run at the CIMH. And this actually has um, predictive capability for dust concentration, particulate matter PM 2.5 and PM 10 concentration. We, uh, we also do ozone and aerosol optical depth. And so what we do with this information is that during the seasons where we expect a lot of dust, we do more close monitoring, we look at the model forecast, and we issue a Saharan dust update, and we distribute this to PAHO and CARFA specifically, to our colleagues at PAHO, PAHO and CARFA. And they can then distribute it within their networks. You also see here the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin, and this puts out seasonal um, information in terms of climate and health uh, issues, climate and health uh, indicators for whatever time period, and it's seasonal. And this is another advisory that is put out. So we have resources out there that are useful, that are significant in terms of monitoring, predicting, and assisting our stakeholders and informing our stakeholders and the general public with respect to air quality. And we are continually working on improving uh, the resources, uh, updating the resources, improving the model forecast, and then also improving our communication in terms of the bulletins and advisories that we put out. So with that being said, I also have a list of references, and some of them may not have been mentioned, but would have gone into, I would have done some uh, reading in terms of the information I've provided. And you would obviously, you would, you could actually look at the re references and see if there are any papers or anything that you're interested in to get further information uh, based on air quality um, in the Caribbean. And so it's about three slides of references. They include US EPA, UNET reports, WHO reports, some WMO stuff, and also publications and so on. And with that, I would like to thank you. I am very pleased to have been able to present this information to you. In the interest of time, I didn't go into too much detail, but I hope I've given you some information to chew on. And I do look forward to the question and answer and discussion session um, before we, we conclude this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Seeley. That was indeed riveting. Um, I three takeaways. I want to say one. Um, I'm very happy to know. I read about this uh, ragged point before, and I was so impressed that Barbados had taken in front of the whole world in monitoring air quality. Um, the second point to take away is that um, she, Dr. Steely, hinted at it is that there are many other pollutants in the air besides those criteria pollutants that we commonly speak of: the carbon dioxide and the carbon monoxide and the ozone and particulates. It's a matter of do we measure it? And we don't. The problem is in measuring. And you cannot, we cannot stop managing what we do not measure. So herein is a problem. And um, the third thing is that the things that are in the air can harm us. It's not only global climate change that it affects, but it also affects individual health. So those are three takeaways. Uh, with that, I'd like to start the next presentation. I think we're experiencing some technical, technical difficulties, my apologies, um, but never fear, we will get on, to, we will move on to Dr. Henry. Um, Dr. Paula Henry, would you uh, please start your, your session while we sort out the technical issues? Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that, Hima. Um, let me start off by...
screen. Okay, so you all could see me here. Okay, so I'm going to start off by, let me start off by share screen. Okay. Okay, can you see my presentation? Yes. Can you see my can you guys see my presentation and can you hear me? Yes. Lango. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hima, for introducing me. It's um good to have all of us here on the same stage today and share some um some of the facts of the greater air quality. My name is Dr. Paula Henry. I am a family doctor, as you heard. Um, my favorite um I've been called PM 2.5 by members of my MPH class. So today I'm going to share a few case histories for you on degraded air quality. My slides are not advancing. Okay, so the nose have it. These are my objectives, and this is my objective. I want to tell you a little bit today about the exposome and the importance of understanding the centrality of the endogenous factors, the, sorry, I am, okay. So I want to tell you a little bit today about the exposome, okay? And I want to tell you about the importance, oops, my slides are going a little bit haywire today, not too sure why. Okay, so I want to tell you a little bit about the exogenous factors, the endogenous factors, and the behavioral factors, and the importance of concentrating on these factors altogether. So I'm going to share three case histories with you today. And all the cases here are real cases. What we have changed, of course, would be the initials, just to make it um, so that you cannot, so we don't have identifiers. The first picture there on the left, you see those of you who have been to Trinidad and Tobago, you see the, our twin towers and our emerging, um, our emerging islands, um, where we have, so you see that dust coming there is coming from the landfills. And for the two year old patient, MJ walks into my office situated a third of the mile northwest of the city's landfill and says, Doc, they're killing me again. Every time the landfill goes up in flames, they're doing the same thing. 16 hours later, she was dead. So that for every one patient, we see who we could identify the cause of death. In this case, we suspected it was air pollution. There are many others that go under the carpet. The second case I want to tell you about is about a 42-year-old female in 2019. She presented to us. She's employed as a janitor. And for the past two years, she had been complaining and she came to see her private care physician. She had at that time constitutional symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, chest congestion, squeezing in her chest, low grade fever, burning cessation after eating pepper, which had been increasing in severity over the past week. And she said, by the way, doctor, I don't have much money. General appearance, she was a slim built female. She appeared poorly nourished and she was angry and depressed because she had built into her local health center complaining that she was feeling unwell and she needed to be seen by the doctor. Um, the doctor said to her, well, we don't see emergencies here, go to the emergency department. She went there and she was not treated because they found no abnormalities on examination. So she came to us, she had a mild temperature. Um, her blood pressure was normal. Her, her BMI was 20.9. Her pulse was a bit elevated and so was her respiratory rate and her oxygen saturation was a bit down. Ex her examination of her systems, everything was normal except that she had a rapid heart rate and we listened to her chest and there was nothing. Her chest was completely clear. On psych, she was a cooperative but she was displaying some anxiety. So the first poll question, I want you to think of her differential diagnosis. Peptic ulcer disease, respiratory tract infection, problems with her heart, low blood count, severe anemia. But I want only the top one answer. So go ahead. So you have your poll question. And now please vote.
Uh, Haley, are you going to share the results? Oh, I'm sharing them now. You should be able to see them. Yes. Okay, well, I have them. Shall I comment on them? Yes, please. Can go ahead. everyone see them? Okay, so you all are right. So 51% says that she has a respiratory tract infection. And yes, this is how it all started. However, the diagnosis here is severe asthma. And this is why we have deaths. Um, this is why we have deaths. And I wanted to point that out because in cases of severe asthma, we do not have any, my, my slide is giving problems to advance and this is what is making it feel like I am not doing a good job. Okay, so yes. So the learning point here is that severe asthma is frequently associated with no signs on auscultation. And these are the patients that we lose. Also, she had a lot of problems, including H. pylori and a low blood count. And when you're treating these patients, you must pay attention to the other comorbid factors. So what investigations should be did? Doctor, don't have much money. A problem in most Caribbean um, territories and her ACT test score, that is something that you can give the patient to do. And hers was 13 over 20. So she gave you the answer, even without examining her. And this is something that you need to do. Of course, the peak flow meter, many of us are familiar with that. And hers were much lower. And I will show you what the normal would be. The ACT control test, you can see there, you can actually assess, get that on the website, asthmacontroltest.com and get your patients to fill that out. You also become cognizant of it because everyone could do this. And this will give us an idea of the, how well controlled the patient's test um, asthma is. The peak flow meter, we are very much accustomed to this but you must get the, um, the desired level for your patient. It varies depending on the patient's height, age, and um, weight. So here you see that her level that we were targeting was 402. And at the time when she presented to us, she was having very severe asthma. Now, Andrea touched on these, so I don't want to belabor them. But a picture paints a, a thousand words. Just remember the importance of taking a history. This patient work, worked with Clorox. And every time she worked with these chemicals, especially where the air condition was bad in her office, she would come in with a, a fulminant flare. Here, we know the burning of garbage in our um, countries is still very much practiced. And that happened, of course, because the garbage truck never used to pass frequently and the habit still continued. That is a problem for lawmakers. This looks like, um, but this is the Saharan dust. Okay, the burning of tires. Again, we need legislation to stop this happening because it happens too frequently and we have black carbon. It's not only giving us asthma, but it is destroying our lung parenchyma. And those of us who are in Trinidad now, and I guess in the other countries in the Caribbean, all the hills look wonderful with the uh, with the pink and yellow pre fl um, flowering. But you know, what's the problem? The patients come into us and they cannot breathe. Why? Because every time we have allergy seasons and every time we have flooding and we get mold seasons, because of the supply chain, decongestants go out of stock in the country. And the patient said, doc, I got sick, you know, because I didn't have any decongestants to get me better. We ran out. Of, and this is a problem, again, for our lawmakers, for our pharmacists, because we need to do something about these small problems. Trinidad and Tobago is an oil and gas company, economy and diesel trucks are ubiquitous. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in my final slide. And of course, doctor talked about this, um, Dr. Seeley, household air pollution. And we have to be very, very um, cognizant that it's the oil-based paints that makes us very sick from air pollution. So just to see how we're gonna manage this, and I don't really want to focus on this, so I'll go very quickly. For the doctors in the group, you must um, follow the GINA guidelines, and you need to teach your patients the appropriate use of the peak flow meter, because this is how we were able to keep this patient alive. We, we She got a peak flow meter, 
and we told her what to do when they began to burn garbage. She needed to get up her, her peak flow meter levels, um, be it use her rescue inhaler or nebulization. And so she was able to manage her condition at home. And we told her, if you if you couldn't get your target up to 320, that was a time for you to seek help. And so that is how she was able to come in. At each visit, um, it is important, and I mentioned this before, identifying triggers and vaccinations. We are not paying attention to vaccinations in our country, and this is a public health problem. We have to remember that because now of climate change, our patients are more prone to infectious diseases. So please vaccinate the patients against everything you see there. I have to put a plug for this, of course, because we know that there's a difference in the carbon footprint between metadose inhalers and dry powdered inhalers. We know the answer to that, so I will move on. So Dr. Seeley talked a lot about the aggregate of particulate matter. We see here in Trinidad and Tobago, it's 22. In the Caribbean, it's 18.3. And we have gotten into a comfort zone. Oh, we're really doing good because, you know, the global level is 4.2. But then when we compare our center, when we compare with the U.S., right, that started off a little bit below us, they have gone down a lot more. Why? Because they have put in certain legislative policies like the Clean Air Act, and we need in the Caribbean to follow suit. So what we did, this is Dr. Um, Babulal and I, we said, okay, so we understand that we could get a, a value for the country, but we need to get um, data, local data for each site. So we, um, Dr. Doctor and I, we embarked on doing this study. It's really a screening study and we began to test the ambient air in 13 different geographical locations in Trinidad. We tested the particulate matter using a handheld um, peak flow meter, and we tested the volatile organic matters using a gas machine. And lo and behold, this is what we found. We found that the areas here on the Northeast coast and East Trinidad had the highest levels of particulate matter. And these are the areas exposed to the Northeast um, trade winds that brought Saharan dust from Africa. The second highest levels here is in our fossil fuel industry at Point Lisas. And we also got high levels in these two towns here on the south coast. And this is because there are a lot of diesel engines passing here. Then we also looked at the volatile organic compounds, and we see that in six of the 13 areas, there were high readings. Again, we were finding those on the East Coast here in Guaya, because there was a leaking pipeline that was making the villagers really ill, and we had to launch an investigation. And the Betham, we had high levels of methane because of the landfills. Now, what is this all about? So we were doing the testing and we took, um, we tested every five minutes to get the different levels. And this is what I wanna show you here. So on the y-axis here, we have PM 2.5 levels. And I just want you to focus on this orange Claxton B, which is here. So we measuring, we measured on the roadway and we've got levels just a little about 10, uh, micrograms per meter. But these peaks, every time you see peak, that is when uh, a diesel truck pass. And the only other time that we got peaks like this is when we got um, people smoking. So we were getting the same peaks with diesel engines as the same peaks with cigarette smoke. And so now we say that air pollution is our, um, it's now um, being Cigarette smoke and air pollution are now falling in the same category. So we need to see, we need to pay attention to that. But this is what I wanted to really teach you about today. And that is the importance of focusing on our exposures, our exogenous factors, um, our endogenous factors. So here we will have all the climate variables that Dr. Seeley told you about. And here we have all the endogenous variables all the comorbid factors, all the pre-existing factors that we also need to, to remember because that would make our vulnerability for our patient population worse, increase vulnerabilities. 
and then our increased risk because of the behaviors that people choose. But don't forget that underlying this, we can change everything. The modifying factors would be good governance, pricing, our HR capabilities and our technologies. And this is the third case I want to bring home to you. This, uh, exactly, this is where I live. This is my home in Trinidad and Tobago. So the neighbors took this screenshot and called me and said, listen, you all have a fire in the bush um, outside your home. What are you doing about it? So of course we called the fire brigade and they took care of it. But then they called again later in the night and said, listen, it seems that that fire is igniting again and it's worse and the smoke is more dense. So yes, so I went down and I checked it out. And yes, and this fire continued to burn for five days. And this is a picture of my mom. I have never seen somebody go into, into rapid uh, pulmonary edema, flash pulmonary edema, all in two hours. It reminds me of how the Barbadians spoke about um, how the hurricane two level went up to five, just so rapidly. And so she went into flash pulmonary edema. And honestly speaking, she would have died if she didn't live in a household such as ours. I just remind you of the vulnerable populations. We need to pay attention to developing fetus. We all forget this, but they are the most vulnerable. These are instruments that we can use at home to help to make a difference. And for the healthcare practitioners, this is my um, president. His name is Enrico, Enrique Barros. Uh, he's the president of Wonka and he has drilled into us one minute for the planet. So if we spend 15 minutes with our patients, we always spend one minute connecting the disease that they came with to a planetary course. So if the patient came with asthma, we tried to connect that to what was causing it. And a doctor spoke about this, and um, this is really has to do with regulation. So this picture was taken from our EMA um, brochure. And we see here that the we, we follow the, the um, 2014 air pollution rules. And our level for um, pollution is 65 micrograms, but the WHO is five. So according to our country, we are hardly ever polluted. You see, there's only two days to the month, whereas if we follow the WHO 21 guidelines, we are polluted every day of the year. And okay, so I'm gonna skip this, but this is, we were called here because people were getting sick. And what they were doing is that they were dumping oil, waste oil in the Karani River. Uh, and they called Dr. Babula because they knew she had the gas met. And this is what we found, a lot of reds. They were making people sick. And you know, we don't have any legislation. So people continue to get sick um, and we don't know the causes. So again, another plug for the legislature and for us. Um, and this is my final slide. And, and I have this, I want you to think about it. This is my final slide. It's called the cost of diesel, I mean diesel. So diesel is the most subsidized of our gasoline products. And we all know that the way we could influence change is through price. People always feel it hard when they're hit in the pocket. So because diesel is so cheap, what we have is a lot of people converted into diesel engines. This is a thought for the legislature. And I wanna say this as my closing word, right? We as healthcare professionals need to have a marriage, a close marriage with the environmentalists. If we want to court and lobby the policy makers, thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Henry. That was very interesting. Um, the takeaway from this is that uh, there are a few takeaways. One, there's a lot we can do um, as uh, people who live in households and what we can do to prevent ourselves to, from being exposed to bad air quality from ambient conditions. The second thing to note is that it is very, very often the case that indoor air quality is a poorer derivative of the ambient air, of the outside air. And it has a lot to do with the kinds of chemicals that we use inside, the amount of mold, the um, the fact that we this is our living space inside, and we gener we have a different microbiome on, on inside our houses, as well as the the chemical exposures 
from the cleaning products, the paints, the fabric, the off-gassing from things like um, from wood furniture. They all contribute to the gases that we inhale from outside. So um, it's just something to bear in mind. And I think this leads quite nicely into um, the final presentation. So we're gonna try the recording again. Dr. Satish Sakamari has a very interesting con um, presentation on exactly how degraded air quality affects health, human health in, in particular. So. Good afternoon. I extend my gratitude to the organizers of the Caribbean Climate and Health Responder course for giving me this opportunity. Though I regret my inability to deliver the talk live. Over the next few minutes, I will focus into the, on the health repercussions of deteriorating high air quality. Air pollution is the fourth leading risk factor for global death. According to the Global Burden of Disease study, exposure to outdoor particulate matter was responsible for about 4.2 million fatalities and about 103 million disability adjusted life years last in 2015. Air pollution is resulting in approximately a two-year reduction in global life expectancy, primarily attributed to the exposure to particulate matter 2.5 particles. About 20 to 40% of mortality from these common medical conditions can be linked to exposure to air pollution. It is worth noting that children and the adult elderly bear a disproportionate share of the health consequences of air pollution. In Trinidad and Tobago, air pollution ranks among the top 10 risk factors for death and air pollution reduced life expectancy in Trinidad and Tobago by one year. And Trinidad and Tobago ranks first in particulate matter 2.5 levels among 19 Caribbean countries. And uh, the, the air pollution is nearly contributing about 15% of all deaths from these common causes. Particulate matter, a varied mixture of volatile organic and inorganic compounds found in the atmosphere, arises from both natural occurrences and human actions. These particles are classified by size, ultra-fine, that is PM 0 0.1, fine, PM 2.5, and coarse, PM 10. Particles less than 2.5 mic micrometers in diameter are especially noteworthy as they can deposit in different parts of the respiratory system and travel into the bloodstream. Both ozone and particulate matter can induce airway inflammation, airway hyperreactivity, and diminish lung function. Meanwhile, particulate matter can also provoke systemic inflammation resulting in cardiovascular and metabolic effects, such as stroke, heart failure, insulin resistance, and diabetes. Effect of air pollution on asthma. Asthma is one of the common respiratory disease, right? Um, is prevalent about 8 to 13 percent in most of the countries worldwide. Right. Air pollution particles, um, particulate matter 2.5, ozone, and nitrogen dioxide, these air pollutants can trigger airway inflammation, hyperresponsiveness, 
and oxidative stress. So genetic variations impacting the regulations of these mechanisms could increase susceptibility, either leading to the development of asthma in previously unaffected individuals or exacerbating existing conditions upon exposure to air pollution. Exposure to ambient air pollution during pregnancy is associated with the disturbance in early life immunity, heightening the risk of allergic rhinitis. You can see here the odds ratio was about um, 2.5 fold and bronchial asthma, which was close to two, two times increased the risk. This was seen in the, the COPSAC study published in 2023. A study conducted in Europe compiling data from various birth cohorts revealed that exposure to nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter 2.5 during early life contributes to development of asthma. You can see here on these graphs, graphs A and B, you can see the significant impact of these uh, pollutants on development of asthma which was not clearly evident with the PM10 and um, the course, uh, the particulate matter course as well. Similar results were observed in another study published uh, a couple months ago, the crew birth cohorts, where early life exposures to nitric oxide and um, particulate matter 2.5 was associated with the later development of asthma, right? This data originates from China, um, a nation significantly affected by air pollution. The study discovered that short-term spikes in particulate matter 2.5 concentration could heighten the risk of asthma exacerbations. Moreover, the relation between particulate matter 2.5 concentration and hospital visits for asthma exacerbation exhibited an approximately linear association. Ozone and hospitalization for acute respiratory diseases. This data was collected from Toronto spanning um, about 15 years, uh, 1980 to 1994, revealing a, a correlation between the, the highest summertime ozone levels uh, measured in parts per billion here, and the total number of respiratory hospitalization among children under the age of two. So air pollution can significantly impact the pulmonary function parameters. So this was a, a retrospective analysis published uh, last year in Lancet Planetary Health. Um, the data was come, collected from two cohorts, Muppets and Aikata cohorts, uh, comprising of children, most uh, six to 17 years in United States cities. The study revealed that heightened air quality index values um, largely influenced by increased particulate matter 2.5 and ozone concentrations was significantly linked to asthma exacerbations and declines in pulmonary function even without triggering viral infection. So if you look at the first graph, this was a forced expiratory volume in one second which is a key parameter, one of the key parameters of pulmonary function. You can see here the patients with uh, no viral infection, right? The green uh, line here, no viral infections, but presented with asthma exacerbation. So with the worsening of the air quality index, the function significantly dropped. So in summary, air pollution um, can impact asthma significantly. 
perinatal air pollution exposure is associated with asthma development in childhood. Particulate matter 2.5 and nitrogen dioxide exposure during early childhood is also associated with the development of asthma. Ozone and particulate matter 2.5 exposure is associated with the asthma exacerbations. Alterations in airways and the immunity system, mostly due to oxidative stress, are the likely causes for the impact of air pollution and asthma. Moving on to the, the next important uh, pulmonary condition, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, which is the third leading cause of global death. And we all know that cigarette smoking is the, the one of the leading causative factor for COPD. However, extended exposure to air pollution is also can lead to um, COPD as well, particularly among the patients with uh, elevated genetic predisposition and unhealthy lifestyle choices. So this data was collected from UK Biobank. Um, so if you look at here, the patients with uh, unfavorable lifestyle and high genetic risk. So there is a significant uh, difference in the COPD occurrence among the patients with high particulate matter exposure. So the combined impact of air pollution, lifestyle factors, and genetic susceptibility on COPD risk exhibited a dose-response relationship in this study. Exposure to air pollution, especially particulate matter and noxious gases, can trigger a more intense immune response in individuals with known COPD. So comparing with healthy individual airways on the left side, the patients with a COPD airway, um, airways, they can develop significant inflammation uh, which releases various immune mediators and leads to exacerbation of COPD and further deterioration of lung function. In addition to airway diseases, air pollution can also lead to significant lower respiratory tract infections, including pneumonias. So exposure to air pollutants can disrupt the function of alveolar macrophages. Alveolar macrophages are the first line defense mechanisms in the lungs. By reducing their phagocytosis ability, enhancing the activity of pattern recognition receptors, and also by triggering the release of various inflammatory cytokines, this cascade can result in heightened patho pathogen load and lung damage. Moving on to cardiovascular diseases. So particulate matter 2.5, they can penetrate deep into the, the lung tissue through the alveoli, where they interact with the resident cells and alter internal structures. So oxidative stress mediators, either directly produced by the particles, particle compounds, are induced by the biological intermediates through activated cellular enzymes. Systems can initiate localized inflammatory reaction, which ultimately leads to cardiometabolic disease. So this meta-analysis, um, Reveal that a notable connection between uh, long term exposure of particulate matter 2.5 and hypertension. Similarly, uh, the short term exposures were linked to hypertension, um, systolic, elevated systolic blood pressure, and diastolic blood pressure. So you can see here uh, particulate matter 2.5, 10 nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide 
um, all of them increase the, the blood pressure after short-term exposure. This retrospective cohort study uh, published last year, so they utilized electronic health record data from Northern California, uh, spanning a 10-year period uh, with a huge population size, about 3.7 million. The findings indicate that exposure to particulate matter 2.5 was linked to elevated rates of incidental um, myocardial infarction, ischemic heart disease mortality, as well as cardiovascular disease mortality. So these outcomes occur even when the current regulatory standards of 15 micrograms per meter cube were met, suggesting that the current WHO standards may not be adequate uh, to protect the health. In another study um, conducted in Canada, Canche cohort, um, including a large population of nearly 2.5 million, right? In, so both particulate matter 2.5 and ozone exposures independently and collectively, um, they can increase the risk of mortality even at the current safety threshold set by WHO. So, um, so you can see here on these graphs uh, for particulate matter. So the, the threshold value is uh, 15. So you can see the elevated mortality risk uh, even below 15. And uh, similarly for ozone is uh, uh, 100, 100. Uh, so you can see the significant mortality, increasing mortality at the lower levels of the ozone as well. So air pollution can also uh, impact diabetes. In fact, the Global Burden of Disease study estimated that 20% of global type 2 diabetes cases are related to chronic exposure to particulate matter 2.5. The systemic inflammation triggered by the inhaled air pollutants coupled with autonomic imbalance and activation of the hypothalamic pituitary axis results in insulin resistance um, across different organs, including adipose tissue, liver, muscle, brain, right, and brown adipose tissue, ultimately leading to diabetes. So based on the data from global burden disease, diabetes induced by particulate matter 2.5 occurs even at minimal concentrations. You can see here, right? Even less than 15 of the current threshold. So you can see the increased risk of diabetes. And with the risk is leveling off at the 50 micrograms per meter cube threshold. So apart from the respiratory, cardiovascular, and uh, metabolic diseases, there are various other conditions, um, morbidities, can be affected with the air pollution, including obesity and metabolic syndrome. There is evidence that air pollution can lead to gestational diabetes, chronic kidney disease and progression to end-stage renal disease, retinopathy, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, interstitial lung diseases and lung cancer. In conclusion, air pollution stands as a major health, public health emergency capable of fostering and worsening a range of illnesses that can ultimately result in fatalities. Ozone and particulate matter 2.5 are pivotal contributors to air pollution related health effects. Both pollutants possess respiratory impacts with particulate matter also demonstrating cardiometabolic effects and increasing the risk of low respiratory tract infections, including pneumonias. The recent data suggests that the WHO 2021 threshold 
may not be sufficiently protective to prevent health hazards associated with air pollution. I thank you all. I uh, would like to answer your questions. If you have any, you can communicate uh, through the organizers. I will try to answer your questions. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Wow. Thank you so very much, Dr. Thakamari. That indeed provided us with a well-researched and well-described informative uh, bit of information on bridging that gap between air pollutants and how it affects us directly in terms of our health. It really is, it really is, it does add a whole new dimension to air pollution and climate change and uh, health, public health. So I wanted to thank you for that. Um, and I would like to open up the floor for questions. After these three riveting, riveting presentations. I'm going to open the Q&A. So just let me say while um, Hima is opening up the Q&A, please, um, you're going to find in the chat the link posted to complete the um, post survey. Um, and so please click on that link. Okay, thank you. And in that link, you'd also find the um the option to choose for CME. So that's important because the link closes after a while. You can't go back and recap. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, you all have been doing a great job joining the WhatsApp group. Continue, please, to join. So there are questions posed to specific presenters, but um, you all are qualified to answer many of them. Um, a few are addressed. Dr. Henry, you asked uh, the lady who died according to uh, your presentation, would she have had underlying conditions? And was it the final straw, so to speak, her being exposed to pollutants? Okay, so first of all, let me say that if I'm going to present a case, um, I would normally get permission from the patient to present, but for, for obvious reasons, this time I couldn't. Um, but what I want to say is that she really had no underlying condition. Her only um, problem was that she would get a certain amount of chest tightness um, and she would normally um, be able to take, you know, treat her symptoms by using her inhaler and um yeah so when she came i don't think she realized how seriously ill she was and that was the problem and there was no she says so what do you find out well there's nothing to find i just you told me the answer so we need to work on it from that point of view so that was a very unfortunate circumstance uh, the next question is to dr seely um did you what is your outlook on Saharan dust for this year? Okay, um, I don't have a definitive answer on that. The outlook on Saharan dust generally would de be determined by the um, rainy season in the Sahel or Sahel Sahara region. Um, at this point in time, um, I'm not, I don't have a definitive answer on what the outlook will be on Saharan dust, but I will tell you this, that generally what we have been seeing in recent years is that we're getting more um, intense dust episodes earlier in the year and going into the summer. And that is a trend that has already started this year and we expect to go into the summer. So we would expect to see some significant dust events probably into June, maybe July, and then you get some reprieve as you go into August and September uh, when you have the um, the rainy season picking up in the Caribbean. I hope this helps at least to answer your question. But we haven't been really doing any, in, at least in this region, any robust seasonal predictions in terms of Saharan dust. But we hope to get to that eventually. Yes. Yes, we winter, winter, was, winter was pretty bad. 
Uh, we actually had some serious dust events even before Christmas and going into January, definitely. We're seeing that more now. Uh, next question, this is from George uh, Adiam Mumbo. Adiam, sorry, I apologize for butchering your name. Um, what is the most common source of PM in particular that there are regulations and measures put in place to ensure that the ambient air remains at levels that are not aggravating to respiratory health in our region? Are you aware of any measures that are widespreadly used or recommended to when we have these high particulate events that can be used? Like in, can, in a can you repeat the question? a medical question? Probably, I think. Um, it's a it's 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 a medical question. When we have events where there are high particulate loadings in the air, are there any recommendations for uh, what people can do to mitigate against the impacts of this high particulate loading in the ambient air? Well, um, yes, I would say yes. And these are frequently announced by the Met Office. The usual things like keep indoors, restrict your um, exercise. Somebody asked in the question about using the I-95 mask, the N95 mask. Yes, that mm -hmm. also helps. Um, so, and there is a new policy now in schools. Once the level reaches a certain um, threshold, they usually let um, students go back home. So, yeah, but I, I want to put a plug for surveillance though, because I think that's the way we should be going now um, in terms of a nation, in terms of a region, because things are going to get bad and we need to, to begin to collect data. And so, and this has to be um, a collaborative effort between us who seeing this on a primary level and the public health practitioners the environmentalists um, and the policymakers, researchers, we need to begin to put um, have more surveillance so that we could actually get the evidence-based information out there to, to affect um, outcomes and to initiate policies. So you're quite right. This is exactly where the meteorologists and the air pollution scientists can um, advise, trigger a warning that this is, this is to be expected, that will using uh, information from the health, produce a health advisory based on this, that people are advised to wear masks if they're outdoors, if you're cardiovascular compromised, to limit your hours outside, do not exercise near roadways, that is always a no-no, things like that. So yeah, this is an excellent opportunity for that. Um, next question is uh can you talk about particulate matter indoors such as candles air fresheners that we normally use indoors and how uh this may contribute to air quality in inside your home okay oh dr henry you were gonna you can go ahead no I, I i'm gonna say <laughs> i don't know if we have any research on this but this is why i put a plug for the portable hole meter, because if we all had this, it, it's not a very expensive device, by the way. And I think if you suffer from um, any kind of allergies or you are particularly prone to degraded air quality, the first thing you do when it's just put it on stick, you know the answer. So that gives you that gives you a certain amount of control or power. So I'm putting in a plug for people to buy a whole peat meter. It's it's very cheap now. You can get it on Amazon. And, and, and you're going to find the answer quickly and you know what you have to do. So that's just a plug for preventative medicine on an individual level. Okay. Dr. Silly, would you like to add? No, nothing to I think that's a great plug. I, I like that. Yes, I totally <laughs> agree. No problem. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> let me add let me add my two cents here. Um indoors, there are if you burn a candle and they have scents in them, you're burning volatile organic compounds. And you're also increasing the amount of carbon monoxide and carbon monoxide indoors, uh, both of which, all of which can actually impact on your respiratory health. So generally cleaners, anything, sprays, insecticides, those are not things that um, are without side effects. And everybody has different metabolisms and sensitivities. And these are chemicals that our bodies are not accustomed to. So it very well may have an impact. 
sometimes negligible, sometimes short term, but sometimes not. So where it is possible to prevent introducing foreign chemicals into your home as much as possible that is advised. All right, next question. Um, um, Dr. Dr. Hima, we, we have to wrap up, unfortunately, because we are at, out of time. Oh so my. I know time flies. <laughs> we have so many great questions tonight, um, but we just do want to make sure we uh, let everybody get off to dinner or whatever they have to do next. Um, we, we will compile all the questions and as much as possible, we will try to provide answers to them. So thank you all so very much for your attention, for your um, for sharing your comments, for all the fantastic presenters, presented amazing information that was new and exciting and um, worrying at the same time, and for the advocacy, because that's what we're all about. We're about using knowledge to advance um, improvement in the human race as much as we can, improvement of lives where we can. So thank you very much. But but wait, we can't let you all go because we have to tell you what's coming up next week. I know you all are all excited to join us again. So I would let the um, somebody take that away. Thank you. Let me share my screen. So so okay, let me just say, Tima, I can I can I can present it. So next week we are going to have Dr. Chris Ura. And he is going to tell us all about zoonotic diseases. And we know that that is now very important. And we're going to have a great case history by Dr. Sanchez. And I will be moderating to make sure that we all um, keep time and you all are enjoying what's going on. So see you next week. And uh, Haley is going to change. Right. And don't forget to scan the QR code so that you can answer the post survey question. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.